Vanessa and Dermot's comments have given me a couple of other points that I'll touch on. One was, one was that back in 1968, um, it was for three weeks, but subsequent uh, uh, study conferences were for two weeks. And then, when we were at Buckingham Palace, I asked the Prince what what was the reason from the two weeks going down to three weeks going down to two weeks? And he said, well, he said, it's like this. The sort of people we wanted to come on the study conference were the sort of people that their employers said, no, you can't have these people for three weeks. You can only have them for two weeks. So it was a compromise between the people that were per permitting their people to attend and the conference organisers who wanted those people, so it ended up being two weeks. So back in my days, it was a bit more relaxed, so we had three weeks of the intensity of, of uh, getting up at 5 a.m., slugging away, then having dinner, and then having a few bottles of red wine, and then we'd go back and prepare our paper and our documentation for the following year. So that was, that was pretty good. Um, Anyway, it's been my pleasure to spend uh, time with His Royal Highness Prince Philip, HRH Prince Philip, five times. Firstly, uh, in 1968 as part of this wonderful study conference that I was lucky enough to be on. Second time was in 1969 as a follow-up conference in Keele University in Stoke-on-Trent, UK. Uh, and the third time was a, uh, a reunion dinner in 2002. And then I was invited along to Buckingham Palace with the rest of the team in 2006. And then I visited a government house in Canberra, and Neil referred to that, uh, that event in Canberra. And uh, then there was a, a meeting with Prince Philip on October 2011. That's right, that's when he was here for, for Chogham. And uh, Prince Philip is known for his zingers, you know. He has a way with words, and he was fascinated back in 1968 at the Australian slang. And he spoke lovingly of a, of a new phrase that he'd not heard before. And he said, he said, I marvel at your, this is what he said, your curry, your curry bloody gated iron roofs. <laughs> he'd never <laughs> heard of that term before. And the other one was wowzers, which was a term that he was not familiar with. He said that, I understand that's what you call people who won't do their bit. And travelling around Australia with uh, Prince Philip, we picked up many words of wisdom from him. And he told us uh, all these things. He told us the rate of change made it more important to teach people how to think rather than teaching them what to know. He, um, he saw the problem of obsolete teachers and itinerant teachers, which he saw as a huge problem for Australia, which didn't exist in other Commonwealth countries. He saw, uh, he, 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 he was in despair of our educational system. Um, he, um, he had uh, some wonderful advice uh, for governments who, dis he described our Australian governments, all levels, as having the fleet footedness of a centipede <laughs> with arthritis. He commented that some of our politicians should keep their wisdom to themselves. In 1968, Prince Philip was ahead of his time with many of his words as they still ring through t true today. He said, ideas are coming into Australia from the young people, but unfortunately there is a time delay before they permeate through to the old. He said, don't leave this change too long. Be tolerant, but not, not permissive with our young. They are as much children of their age as we were of ours. He recognised that a single approach does not suit everybody. He said, you can bring up your children by the book as long as you use a different book for each child. He asked us to think and speak always as individuals and not, just never think of ourselves as being spokesman for an industry or spokesman for a company or spokesman for a body. You are spokesman for you. And uh, 
he hated this sort of what we now call group thinking and group speak. He was so focused on individual and individualism that when he invited us to Buckingham Palace for the, for the 50th anniversary, he, he said, listen, you can't bring your wives or partners because I'm not bringing mine. <laughs> His secondary message was always, don't be afraid to excel and be the very best person you can possibly be. He told us to get over the great Australian distrust of excellence. And we still have it. All of us in business know what I'm talking about. It's a limitation on our whole psyche here. He commented that our grandfathers described themselves as, as being the last generation of untrained managers. But he said to us, when we meet, when we meet the managers of the future, we'll re realise that our grandparents were talking about us. Mm -hmm. These comments and the study to itself were behind my inspiration to set up Mancal as I enjoyed the experience of being thrown into a pressure cooker educational trip with 300 people from business, equally from business, government and trade unions, 100 from each of those categories. Um, we had to personally report back to Prince Philip where he then proceeded to belt the hell out of us and he trained us not to waffle. If he thought we were going off message and rambling, he'd step up and boy, tear the strips out of you. And uh, he taught us how to ask questions when we went into communities. He said, you f the first time you ask questions when you're moving around communities, the first time you ask a question, you won't get, you won't get a proper answer. They, they'll think you're just being polite. So ask them again. And then they'll suspect, hey, he might really want the truth. You might really want an answer. But don't stop at that. Talk for a little while and then ask him the third time. And he said, it's that answer that I want you to bring back with you. That's what I want to hear. Not the first or the second answer because you haven't got inside by then. Uh, I guess uh, the formula was pretty much they took a cross section of 300 what they called, they called us modern people. We'd call them the movers and shakers from 30 British country, uh, Commonwealth countries and split us into 25 groups, 11. And then we were tasked with the same job of quickly reporting back every day, completing our report for that day because tomorrow was another day and we didn't want to have yesterday cluttering up tomorrow. Uh, we, uh, we, our group went to Queensland and visited Townsville, Ingham, Mount Isa and Brisbane and we were amazed to see the absolute rec the, the resig resigned acceptance of inferior education, inferior health services, inferior transport. When we asked those questions of some families the third time, that's when some of them broke down because they didn't realise how badly serviced they were living in communities like Mount Isa. Your kid gets a toothache. You've got to fly them to Townsville and probably Townsville, the doctor or dentist are busy, so you take them to Brisbane. You take 10 days off to go and get what are in the suburbs. We just walk to the corner dentist and get it fixed in 10 minutes. Complete. And the educational facilities were such that the parents only saw their kids maybe twice a year when they'd sent them away to school. Tremendous damage to families. One of the interesting uh, uh, towns was Ingham. Anyone heard of Ingham? A sugar town way up in North Queensland. You'd walk around Ingham and you'd see the people, the, 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 the nationalities of the, of the population of Ingham were clearly, and they were quite identified as Greek, Italian, Spanish, German, Finnish, Chinese, Scottish, English and others. All completely integrated. 
as, uh, as we decided, uh, all without any enabling legislation. <laughs> Those people left to themselves, integrated themselves, a model community. Each ethnic group policed the behaviour of themselves so that it made sure that they were good representation for the people that they, their ethnic groups. Fantastic. Uh, now, Prince Philip, as I mentioned, was well known for his quotes and one-liners, often brutally honest. Here are some of the insights he shared with us. Uh, he, he told us to be aware of carelessness toward the quality of life itself which flowed, obviously flowed over to the other, other conferences that followed because you, you touched that theme. In light-hearted moments, he asked if it was true that the Japanese were hesitant in attacking Australia because they mistook all our, out, uh, our uh, outdoor, outback toilets out in the backyard as sentry boxes. He was convinced that they were very quite, quite terrifying sight if you were about to, to confront the country. He told us about the two English judges. They tried each other. <laughs> now, he had an incredible sense of style. And I'll just give you one example. At the 1969 conference at Keele University, due to start at 10 a.m. on the Saturday morning, we were all out the front of the university on the steps. No Prince Philip. No sign of the limousine-driven car down the long driveway. We knew how fastidious it was about timing. We were looking at our watches, saying, oh, boy, we got him this time. And then pop, 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 pop. A helicopter appeared from nowhere, landed straight in front of us. Out popped pilot Prince Philip, buttoning up his jacket as he strode up to start the conference right on the dot of 10 a.m. Real James Bond stuff. <laughs> Fabulous. So, you can see... Uh, and anyway, that brings us right up to 2017. Uh, and uh, what have we got here? Oh, I'll just mention. That's going through some of the old records, I find a... Uh, 60... 56. Uh, I call that prehistory. It's so long ago, I've been uh, way back. There was no intention that there was going to be a follow-up conference. It was a one-off event, and it was only from the attendees of that conference they said, hey, that went well, we should do it again in another six years. So the, the contingent here, I just picked out a few people that you may be familiar with, Sir Avi Pabo, probably, the, probably the, the, the industrial, the corporate champion of the last century, the whole century, simultaneously chairman of WMC, BHP and Alcoa. Amazing, amazing feat. Uh, Charles Copeman, Robe River, rescued the iron ore industry, and many of you will be aware of his bravery and courage there. Bob Hawke started up as a union leader, uh, became prime minister, and then a businessman. Sir Philip Lynch, uh, uh, he was a minister for the army under Fraser, he was treasurer before handing over to John Howard. Then he handed over the deputy liber liberal leadership to John Howard, started his pub public role and I first met him back in uh, 1956 or something. He was the, the president of JC's, which is like a junior chamber for Australia, and I was the president in Kalgoorlie. But interesting, interesting, without him, I wouldn't have even have heard about the Duke of Edinburgh Study Conference because he said to me, way back then, he, he, he said the best thing that ever happened to him was to be sent away on the study conference. And... Uh, he said, Rod, if you ever get a chance, apply for it. Try to get into that because I've I got no way of telling you, but that's very significant. I didn't think another thing about it till, oh, what, till, uh, well, till six years later. Uh, when I, in Kalgoorlie, I was running, uh, I was 32. My dad had died two years before. I was running the family business. I had a, four kids. I had a, a business in Kalgoorlie at a, farm in Esperance and I was, I was pretty busy and I, a visiting engineer came from Perth. I had to pick him up at the Palace Hotel, take him out to Campbellda for the day, went to pick him up. He hadn't finished breakfast, he was still eating breakfast with some other guy, all that sort of stuff over there. Which, and I said to them, look, unless they uh, get real and talk, talk about the world out there, we, we're not terribly interested in uh, WA getting involved too much. But uh, 
So that's where it, that's where it is. Now, what do we do with the next one? Yeah. I, I just uh, quickly on uh, anyway. That's uh, that's um, one of the consequences of the Prince Philip thing. Of course, is uh, is uh, that it's. Uh, Stimulated me to, to kick off the uh, do one more. I think uh, do uh, create this Mantcal Foundation. Now I it's not a commercial, but I just want to tell you that that, that uh, the other one, the, oh, the other one with the two logos here. Yeah, I, I got, these are called computers. I must learn all about them. <laughs> <laughs> this thing, th this has been our logo since about uh, we've only been in business 120 years, but this. That's a, that's a conveyor. There's a crusher down there. That's a conveyor. You do you you crush. You sort. You you. you uh, so the finished product is here. That's the that's the product of real value, and you cut that off to the marketplace. If it's any good, you make some money. So we've we've used that same logo in the Mancal Foundation. There, so we, we bring a lot of ideas. We crush them or refine them. We get, spit out all the bad ideas, and then the the good stuff goes out on the conveyor belt in the form of bright young people that are better for the experience. So that's uh, that's the theme there. So the next one, I think that's the next one's the last one. So we, we're doing pretty well. Now that's about where we the, the two influences that created Mancal Foundation was back. When I was 16, I got involved with the Foundation for Economic Education, the moral foundation to capitalism, limited government, individual responsibility, aligning your business and personal ethics. Well, the things that Vanessa and uh, Dermot have been speaking about, but there was, there was not much strategy. There was mainly being a repository for all this wonderful knowledge. So it was a belief system. Over here, the Prince Philip uh, thing that I got involved with in 1968, many years later, I realised that's that was the missing limit. That was all strategy, all training and strategy, and no no philosophy. You put both things together, and again we stick them up through this conveyor belt, uh, refining ideas, blending thoughts and action, and out pops the Mancal Economic uh, Foundation. So from tonight we'll we'll send a message across to uh, to Prince Philip, who's 96 this year, and. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll send him the regards from us all. So, uh, um, so that's, uh, so I think that's the, uh, these young people that we sent away, uh, they uh, realise the unintended consequences of today's uh, short-term legislative solutions and stuff. That's, again, ideas have consequences, particularly when we apply them to study of liberty. So in this year, it's Mancal's 20th anniversary. The momentum is building to the point where it's uh, taking my mind off my day job. Too bad, I say, because I'm enjoying uh, what this new uh, career has got for me. Now, uh, so I think as uh, Prince Philip wrote a letter to us all uh, in 2006 and said, listen, uh, we want you to uh, write a little piece to put in our 50th anniversary book which we all did, and it's all there. That's the outcome. In, where it's only our 20th anniversary, so I've got to stick around. In 30 years' time, I'll be writing a letter to all you guys and say, listen, we're doing, instead of a little thin 20th anniversary thing, we're going to do a big, fat 50th anniversary thing, write a little piece, and we'll stick it in the big book. So, fellas, you can see it's made a big difference to me, and I'm very thankful to have had this opportunity.